All right, we're going to go ahead and get the morning going. So we've got uh, Leon Stigter to talk about uh, trust, trusting your ingredients. I know, right? What ingredients are, you, are we supposed to trust? So actually, that, that's a good question. And uh, I told this story to, uh, to a bunch of people before when uh, my wife was, uh, was making cheesecake. My wife loves to bake. Um, so as she's sheing this record, yes, I'm very lucky. As she's, sheing, uh, as she's going to see this recording, she's going to be very happy that I mentioned that. I hope. Um, and, and as she was, was walking through how she makes cheesecake, I'm like, well, that's almost the same, sort of the same steps I do when I, when I write my apps. Uh, whether it's, it's using Go or, or Node.js or whatever, it's, it's relatively similar. Um, but I totally realized that we just had lunch, we just did karaoke, so I did want to get started with a game of Jeopardy. Um, any non-Americans in the house except for me? Okay, good. So, does that everyone know what Jeopardy is, though, before... Do you, do you know what Jeopardy is? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, just... <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Okay, I should have asked any, any non-Americans, non-Canadians in the house. Okay. So, what we're going to do, I'm going to have up here, like, two statements. Uh, one, one at a time, obviously. And um, I'll just get started. So, this software project... Uh, caused a giant security breach and compromised the personal information of as many as 143 million Americans. Um, does anyone know the answer to this? And by the way, in total Jeopardy format, you should... No, I wasn't asking for the company. That would have been right, though. But the software project. What is Apache Struts? But I like the, the Aquifax answer. That, that was pretty good, too. Okay, second one. Um, an attacker could exploit this by using a malicious tar binary to write uh, files to any path on a target machine whenever. It is one of the largest software projects in the world that a lot of people, I'm guessing, here in the room use as well. Almost. Anyone? Oh. No. No? What is Kubernetes? And this was a very recent exploit. Good. So now that we're all like super shocked about the stuff that we're using in production today. I mean, I always. Oh yeah, me too. But you know, that's that's a different story. Um, really? Okay, I was gonna say that's a bad idea, but we'll we'll get you that. Exactly. Um, so I work for VMware, and uh, I am part of a team called Cloud Journey, and what we do is we talk about uh, taking your apps to public cloud. So for us, it's really important, while we totally realize a lot of people use uh, VMware's resources on-prem, that a lot of people are moving into the cloud. And with uh, Cloud Journey, that is what we do uh, to, to help you facilitate that. So. Uh, by the way, if anyone's expecting me to be here and sell you VMware stuff, that's not going to happen. OK, I'm seeing no one's leaving. That's good. Um, so by the way, if anyone's wondering who, uh, who I am, so I'm a Leon Stichter, developer advocate, passionate about things like serverless, uh, containers, and pretty much everything that runs in the cloud, either public cloud or private cloud. Um, and I love dad jokes, cheesecake, and go. So that's also why this talk is about cheesecake. Sorry? Good point, uh, the programming language in this case. Yeah, I'm not that great in the game Go. I tried it a few times, it wasn't really my thing. Um, so it is DevOps days, so I did want to talk about DevOps like real quick. And uh, what is DevOps? And as you, uh, as you talk about what is DevOps, to me it sort of means destroy every version on production servers. <laughs> Good. Um, however, a lot of people, and I hope everyone here as well, would uh, sort of look at this as what is DevOps. You know, that infinity symbol talking about everything going from uh, building to deploying to production and doing that in a continuous fashion. Um, and then a few years ago, we thought, you know, probably we should add some security in there. We should add some, some, uh, some DevSecOps. And what is DevSecOps? Well, to me, it means that you add security to anywhere in your, uh, in your CI CD cycle. Um, 
So I think there are like three P's of, of DevSecOps, and we'll get to each one of them as we walk through what a chef does and what an FDEV does. And I think it all starts with, with protocol. So that's like the what of DevSecOps. I mean, it's things about implementing zero trust, ha uh, not trusting anyone except for hopefully the people that, that you work with. Um, second is, is process. Uh, it's how. How are you getting your, your stuff into production? How are you working with the people that you hopefully trust? And this is all about how are you adding that security into, uh, into your pipelines? And then philosophy. Why are we doing this to begin with? And I mean, that is true for both making cheesecake as, as well as, or any type of dessert for that matter, if you're not a cheesecake fan, uh, or writing any type of app. It all comes down to why are we doing this? Um, and sort of staying in the security uh, corner a bit, who actually cares about security? Yeah? Okay, I see a few people not raising their hands. That is slightly worrying. <laughs> slightly worrying, and I'll tell you why. Um, so I worked with uh, a company called Risk-Based Security. Uh, they do massive research on, on security breaches. And in the first quarter of 2019, more than 1,900 security incidents were reported. And that, and that is up by uh, more than 55% versus, last quarter, uh, versus the first quarter of last year. That is massive. And more than in those uh, 1,900 incidents, more than 2 billion Ident uh, identity records were, uh, were compromised. That is up by almost 30%. That, to me, is massive. I mean, almost 2 billion uh, PII records, personal identifiable information, that was, uh, was exploited. Um, so some, some interesting facts. I mean, there are three breaches that have cost more than 100 million records to, uh, to go out. Uh, the business sector is targeted in pretty much every case. And um, hacks are pretty much every type of, uh, of breach that, uh, that we have. And then my, my absolute most intriguing fact from that, uh, from that report is that 14.7% of all breached organizations were unwilling or unable to disclose the number of records that were exposed. I mean, if you're unable, that's a really bad thing. If you're unwilling, that's maybe even worse, because in that case, Someone stole someone, uh, someone else's identity, or at least some information, and isn't willing to share how that happened or why that happened. So now that we talked about, a bit about security, why that is important, and how that fits into, uh, into DevSecOps, let's welcome uh, our two main characters to the stage. First of all, because we're making cheesecake, I brought a chef. Because, because I like go, you'll see a bunch of gophers. Um, second of all, because we're, uh, because we're also gonna, gonna build an app, I also brought an FDEV with the cute little laptop. Uh, and these characters are drawn by, uh, by Ashley McNamara. Uh, she has an amazing repo up on, uh, up on GitHub. So if you want to check it out, absolutely check those. Um, so what does a pastry chef need? I mean, if you look at what a pastry chef does on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, in order to make a cheesecake, he's going to need ingredients. Uh, he needs a recipe. He's going to need some kitchen aids like a whisk, a bowl, a spatula, stuff like that. Um, they're going to need appliances like an oven, a fridge uh, to put things in. And obviously, at least in my case, um, they would need a fork in order to eat it. Ultimately, in, at least in my experience, the eating part is the nicest. So building an app is relatively similar. I mean, if you're, if you're an app, you're going to need something, uh, if you're building an app, you're going to need some ingredients like the libraries, the modules, the jar files, the gems. Um, you're going to have some source code. You're going to have a bunch of dev tools that you need, like CLIs, uh, uh, version control systems, uh, like GitLab, for example. You're going to have a bunch of build tools. And ultimately, you're going to have a runtime, like Kubernetes. So first question, let's imagine that you're going to be a pastry chef. So imagine that you're standing in your favorite restaurant, and uh, you're the pastry chef. You're about to create the ultimate dessert. Obviously, I hope that's cheesecake, but if it's not, that's OK, too. Um, will subpar ingredients get you the best cheesecake ever? Exactly, thank you. So that is not going to happen. So you're going to need high quality uh, ingredients, high quality, high trust, because you also want to know where it's coming from. And that is the other thing. Where do the vendors that I use, the people that I go to to buy my ingredients, where do they get their ingredients from? 
So having some form of traceability uh, from the origin all the way to when it ends up in, in my kitchen and ultimately into, um, into my cheesecake, where is everything coming from? And the thing is that if you look at it, there are three things that matter very much for, uh, for ingredients. So you want to have entry and transparency where things are coming from. Uh, you want to have traceability, making sure that you know who your vendor is, and you want to know who that vendor's vendor is, and so on, all the way up to wherever it's going to come from. Um, and trust. Trust is incredibly important. And we'll touch on trust a few more times during this, this presentation as well. So as an app dev, where do my ingredients come from? I mean, uh, there are a bunch of programming languages here. Um, and where are they going to come from? If I'm a Go developer, then I'm going to get my ingredients from something like Go Center, or maybe if it's, uh, if it's on, uh, on, on a private repository, something like GitLab or GitHub, in order to make sure that I get my, my source code from somewhere that I trust. I mean, if I do uh, JavaScript, then I obviously get them from npm.js or somewhere else. If I do Python, then from, from PyPy. Um, did I miss any very important languages here? Just to make sure. Good. So in this case, it's still very important. Where do I get my ingredients from? And I care about traceability in this case because I have to identify what is in that package. I mean, if I'm a chef, and hopefully not, I pick up like an ingredient box from, uh, uh, from, from Whole Foods or whatever, read the ingredients, then I want to know what is in that package. I need to know what is in that package as a chef. And the same thing as an app developer, I kind of need to know what is in there. Because ultimately, when I use it in production, someone is going to trust me with doing the right thing. Um, I probably want to know who else is using it. If I'm the only person using a certain, uh, certain library, certain project, then that may or may not say something about the quality of their project. Uh, and obviously, I, I want to identify where it's stored. If it's somewhere on GitHub, if it's somewhere uh, indexed, by, uh, by a trusted source, it's going to say a lot more about the trustworthiness and the traceability of that library than when it comes from some obscure FTP site. I obviously hope that no one downloads their libraries from an obscure FTP site. That would be really bad. Um, so just, just do a, we'll do a quick poll, hands up. Um, it, are you using open source technology today? That's good. So second question, do you have any influence over the open source tools that you're using today? Who is? OK, I see a little. OK. So it turns out, if you said yes to that second question, are you, uh, do you have some influence, then you're not alone. The vast majority, like 71% of developers, have some influence over what they use in production as terms of, uh, of tools. So whether that is getting to choose their favorite editor, uh, getting to choose what kind of library they're using, getting to choose what programming language or, uh, or paradigm they're using. Those things are important to developers, uh, including me, and we get to choose that, which is actually pretty awesome. That also means, looking at a bunch of other statistics, that 98% of developers use open source tools uh, at work. And if I remember correctly who had their hands up, that was pretty much everyone here as well. 96% of all commercial apps, and the ones that we build at VMware are no different, use some form of open source tooling in there. Uh, and, 70, and this to me was, was pretty amazing. 79% of all businesses, so the people that we work for at, at the end of the day, they use open source tools as a key component within their, uh, their infrastructure. They use open source technology. They rely on some other developer to have created something that runs a key component within their business. And then my favorite question, who's here with a colleague today? Nice, OK. So especially for those of you that are in the room with a colleague today, do you trust your colleague? No, I heard someone say no. That's good. <laughs> I mean, I obviously hope that the answer to, to that one is, yes, I trust my colleagues. OK, good. I see someone getting smacked. That's, that's not entirely what I, what I was hoping with that, but that's a good question with, uh, with source code. 
Okay, good. Um, and, you know, that's, that's obviously a bit of a joke because I, I honestly hope that everyone at least trusts their colleagues when it comes to building libraries, creating source code. Um, but do you trust a developer that is maybe a thousand miles away at the other end of the country, at the other end of the world, with making a key component for your application? Whether that is something that ultimately ends up in Kubernetes, whether that is something that ends up in uh, Apache Struts, whether that is something that ends up in a Go module. Are you trusting that developer? And the answer to that is, hopefully when it's something like Kubernetes is, yes, I'll, I'll trust that. If it's a very unknown project, maybe a bit less. And that is where trustworthiness comes in for, uh, for libraries, for, for software dependencies as well. I mean, end-to-end -end transparency is, again, very important. Do you trust that? Do you know who that other developer is? Do you trust that developer? Can you trace back what that person did from uh, the first commit that they did to update the dependency all the way to what you're running in production today? And that ultimately comes up to, to trust. Do you trust that person? Or do you trust that organization? So I think it's safe to say that having trust in where your ingredients are going to come from is both important in making cheesecake as well as in building apps. Everyone agrees? Good. Otherwise, we're going to have a very, very annoying rest of the conversation, letting you know. Um, so second thing, let's, let's talk about recipes a bit. And recipes, at least for, uh, for chefs, are obviously all about their trade secrets. I mean, that is how they make their special dish. That is how. Uh, a two-star Michelin restaurant makes their noodles. That is how uh, McDonald's make the sauce for their, uh, for their Big Mac, uh, assuming that still nobody knows how that's actually done. And the interesting thing, and I'm pretty sure that you cannot read this, at least not yet, uh, because I'll make the slides available, is that a lot of recipes get stolen. So the way that we protect our recipes within the software industry is obviously using Good. Who said licensing? That is exactly right. Yes. The other two were correct as well, by the way. Um, obviously, licenses. And if you get, some, uh, get your project somewhere from, uh, from an open, uh, open place, that is all about open source licenses. And I took a screenshot. I know it's unreadable. So you'll have to trust what, uh, trust, nice. <laughs> What, what I have there on, uh, on the slide, that uh, on this page, you have 35 different licenses. Uh, 13 of them require you to publish the sources that you create when you use that, that component. M more interestingly, four of them allow your users to ask for your source code if you're running that as a hosted version. Can you imagine that if Google, for example, used that in Gmail, we would all be able, assuming you use Gmail, we would all be able to get the source code. We would be able to allow to ask the source code of Gmail. Wouldn't that be awesome? Assuming you want to run your own. Um, recipes in software is obviously about which, which one do you need. And it, it turns out that if you, if you shift left, and I know that is a total marketing term, but if you shift left what you do about security, then you're 11 times faster to fix whatever problem is caused by security issues than if you do not. If you let uh, things go into production, it's going to take 11 times longer than if you would have found out at like where you commit. So things like, uh, I was actually, ah. so security is your friend. I mean, seriously, there are developers out there that are like the true sentries of, of a product. I mean, they know every single, uh, every single letter of source code that's been written, every single bit and byte that goes into, into production. Those people, you all here in the audience, you are the true sentries of, of your product, making sure that you have safe source code. Um, so when you think about recipes and software, common faults, obviously, input validation, making sure that a number is actually a number, not a string, uh, memory corruption, things like numeric errors, probably one of my favorites, um, because I obviously always fail to check that, and cryptographic issues. If you encrypt stuff and you decrypt stuff, are you sure that that's exactly the same? But what about things like hard-coded passwords? Um, whoever, who's ever committed something to GitHub with a hard-coded password or API key in there? And I'll be honest, I did it too. Right? 
So that is, that is tough. Those are things that we need to watch for. I mean, missing validations, uh, backdoors, whether or not you created that purposefully or not, and things like data anomalies. Are we sure that if we, if we expect that a name is being sent in, that it's actually a name? So those are things that, that are incredibly important when you think about your recipes in software. Recipe in software is nothing more than uh, the steps that your compiler needs to take, that your user needs to take, to get from A to B. The same that your, uh, your chef is going to create a cheesecake from A to Z. So dependencies, at least in, in my view, uh, coming from, uh, fr from companies that have dealt with that, uh, they need to be immutable. Because the best way to guarantee issues in your source code is to do a git push minus f, a force push into git. By the way, if you've ever done that, please don't. Um, I kind of want to make sure that libraries, if we use them, that they are kept safe, including the rest of your recipes as well. Um, any Node.js developers in the room here? No? Okay, nice. So a few years ago, there was this issue with, uh, uh, with a library called LeftPad, six lines of JavaScript code that disappeared from the internet and caused havoc to like millions of builds. Millions of products could no longer be built because six, uh, six lines of JavaScript code were, were, were gone. Obviously, it took them some time to, uh, to fix that, um, and that's a problem. And obviously, do you trust your suppliers enough? And it comes back to trust again, making sure that you know where your, your stuff is coming from. So, I guess it's also safe to say that for both making cheesecake and making apps, that recipes are critical. Um, so don't lose them. Please don't delete them from the internet if you publish them for other people to use. Um, and also make sure that if you publish them somewhere that, that people can validate that it comes from you. So next up, talk, let's talk about tools. I mean, uh, a chef is, is going to have their favorite set of, of pots and pans. They're going to have their favorite kitchen equipment. Um, as a developer, you're going to have your favorite source code editor. You're going to have your favorite source control system. So to me, picking a source control system is somewhat like uh, my wife or, or chef out there picking her or his favorite set of knives. Um, the thing is, if you're hoping that I'm going to tell you what the best one is, I'm not going to do that simply because I don't know all of your use cases. And I think that every developer, and this goes back to, uh, uh, to one of the slides I talked about earlier, where 71% of developers gets to choose uh, what tools uh, their company uses, I hope that everyone is able to choose the tool that they use, that they can choose what fits best for their, their particular use case. If that's a $1,000 set of knives, super awesome. If it's not, also super awesome. So choosing the right equipment, um, who, who here has kids? Who of those kids has that super cute little, uh, little kitchen over there, right? Or hat, or hat, yes. I mean, if you're going to make a, a super awesome cheesecake, is that the kitchen and the kitchen equipment you're going to choose? Probably not. Sorry? Okay, you, you know what, that's fair. Yes, okay, I like that, I like that. According to his daughter, that is absolutely the kitchen equipment that, that you're going to use. You're right. Um, more likely, though, uh, a chef is going to end up with something like that. And the whole idea here is that you're going to have enough working space to put out all your ingredients to make sure that you have, um, you have a set process. And within the... Uh, 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 within the space of a chef, that's called the mise en place, making sure everything is in the right place, making sure that the process is ready to be completed with the, uh, uh, the least minimal uh, additional steps. So that, that means that you can always, from A to Z, every single time, that you can follow the same process. Um, so if I look here at my super awesome dual monitor setup, it's kind of nice, right? Um, that means that I can follow the exact same process, and we call that continuous integration and continuous delivery. Thank you. Yes, exactly. CICD. 
So we're in CICD, and uh, if I press the next button, you'll, you'll obviously see it. Um, where in CICD should we place our, uh, our security scans? Where do we put our, our component analysis? Where do we put our, our static code analysis? Where do we put our runtime security? CI, okay, yes. Pre-commit, yes, love it. Anyone else? Anyone on this side? Okay, so we obviously want to put that as far left as possible. So ideally, and I absolutely agree with you, we want to put that here in code or at least in, in the commit section. And the nice thing about, as I, as I talked a bit about what we did with, uh, what we do with, with Cloud Journey, is we talked about a process called continuous verification, where it all comes down to how, how optimized can I make sure that my code is going to production? So making sure that my source code is safe, using a bunch of checks, in, uh, using open source tools, by the way, that the performance is going to be OK. Because if I translate that back to, uh, uh, back to a chef, then I want to make sure that my fridge is, is correctly on the correct temperature, that my oven is on the correct temperature. Um, and cost, because at the end of the day, my company wants to know what we're spending in production, what we're going to spend in production. If I'm a chef, the owner of the restaurant, or me if I am that owner, I want to know what I'm spending to make that cheesecake. So those are things that are incredibly important. And with the Cloud Journey team, my team made an amazing demo using a bunch of open source tools, uh, 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 Claire, uh, GitLab, uh, who are here as well, uh, deploying that to, to a Kubernetes cluster. And we wrote a bunch of blogs about what we call continuous verification. So if you go to cloudjourney.io, you'll find a bunch of things that we've written about how we do that. Again, using a bunch of open source tools, so it's free. Again, I'm not here to sell you software. And that was a good thing, right? Good. So there are a few do's and don'ts that I think are important for, for DevOps. And um, I came to that after talking to a bunch of awesome developers, you all in the room here, and a bunch of companies that, uh, that I've worked with and worked for. So one, treat your DevOps as code. I mean, the whole idea that we have infrastructure as code is incredibly important. Um, automate your process as much as possible, and that obviously means that if you turn it into code, you're going you're to be able to test it. You're going to be able to make sure that it has the least errors possible. Standardize and automate your security and governance processes. Because if you standardize and you automate, you make sure that you have the least amount of errors. And if you're standardized, you can repeat it. Uh, get, get some insights into, into what you're doing as an end-to-end -end process. I mean, draw it out on a wall. Use some software to map it out. But have an idea of how and what you're deploying and why you're deploying it. So that comes back to like the three Ps of, of DevSecOps. I obviously also have a bunch of don'ts. Don't have developers write and maintain the scripts for DevOps. And what I mean with that is don't have them do that as their day job. It shouldn't be their task to only and always write those scripts for every single release that you do. Because that comes back to uh, uh, the optimizing and automating. Have them write it once so that you can reuse it over and over for every deployment, ideally. So think about the, the, your current tools and your processes and think about how magically they will work when you're moving everything to a container and when you're moving everything to the cloud. More likely than not, the answer is it's not magically going to work. So think about when you're doing that, what tools are going to help you. Some of those tools could be ours. Some of those tools will be not, will not be. Um, also, don't believe that a single vendor is going to be your answer to everything. I mean, as much as I would love to say that we at VMware have all the answers uh, and all the software that you need, Obviously, that's true, but that's a different story. Um, there are going to be other tools out there as well. So think about, and this comes back to being able to, to make the choice yourself. Make sure that you look at your use case and make sure that you pick the right tools for that use case. And also don't think that security is someone else's problem. I mean, when I started off asking with who really cares about security, I saw a few hands that didn't go up. And I think that as an industry, as developers, as, as ops, as DevOps people here in the room, we are all 
responsible for the, uh, the production code that we put out as a company. Whether that is me writing a bunch of scripts, running, running some code that's ultimately going to live on uh, something like AWS Lambda, or whether that's you writing some, uh, some code that's going to live somewhere else, we are responsible for what we do in our community. Uh, also, don't think that a firewall is like the only thing you're ever going to need in terms of security, because it's relatively easy to hack through a firewall nowadays. So now that we're ready to eat our cheesecake, uh, so I hope we have some cheesecake ready. No, I'm kidding. You weren't making it here? Yeah, I thought about doing that. I, I, I thought about making cheesecake here as well, but um, it turns out I'm a very terrible baker. Um, so I would have had to fly my wife out here, and uh, I could have done that. You're right. I mean, this is That's fair. I'll, I'll talk to my manager about it. That's also true. It takes, it takes slightly longer. Um, but let me share some, some final thoughts. Uh, so make sure that, that your ingredients come from a safe place. Make sure that they come from trusted vendors. And um, when I say trusted vendors, that doesn't mean that it has to be a paid component. I mean, that absolutely can be open source, as long as you can, uh, can check that it's safe, whether using some, uh, some, some static source code analysis tools, whether that is because you absolutely know that developer, um, just make sure that you keep it safe, that they keep it safe. Make sure that you keep your recipe safe. I mean, um, if you were the author of LeftPad, please don't delete it again. Um, if you are the author of, of some other open source tool that someone else is using, just keep it out there. I mean, there are people depending on your library. Again, choose the right tools for the job. I, mean, I totally realize that not everyone is going to need a $1,000 uh, a set of chef knives. I mean, I don't have that. My wife doesn't either, for that matter. Uh, she would love to, though. Got it? Plan, definitely, yes. Um, so ma make sure that you choose the right tools for the job. And the only person that can answer what, is, what are the right tools for, for my job is going to be you yourself. So do some research, do some POCs. Most tools have POCs available uh, or free trials. Make sure that you're able to choose whatever it is that, that you feel comfortable with. Um, and make sure that you have a transparent process. Because at the end of the day, when you leave your company or when you're on vacation or when you're out sick, then someone else has to be able to go in, see what you did, why you did it, and how to replicate it. So if you want to have some more information, then obviously go to cloudjourney.io, um, uh, follow us at cloudjourney.io, because I'll make sure that we tweet out the link to these slides. Um, so if you want to take a picture of, um, of the slides, this would be the one to do, because it has all the, uh, the URLs on there. If you want to follow me when I talk about cheesecake or apps, then I am at Leon Stichter on, uh, on the internet. Um, and with that, I totally appreciate everyone for coming. Thank you, and enjoy the conference. If we have time for questions, we can totally do that. Is there any questions? Any questions, anybody? Nope. All right. I guess I wasn't that clear. I know, right? I mean, the only thing that could have been better is if I actually had cheesecake here. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as feedback, so. <laughs> Actually, here's the question. So are the chill in the refrigerator cheesecakes, real cheesecakes? <laughs> um, I would say no. But, um, I mean, I, I would eat them. I'm not going to lie to you. I would totally eat them. But they would not be the cheesecake, or I wouldn't necessarily call them cheesecakes. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.